הלו. ממי טוב שהתקשרת. התגעגעתי. שלומי. Good morning, Ariel. How are you? And I'm happy to do uh, this interview with you about uh, Cayet Noir, uh, which is for me a, a major work uh, of you, but uh, also a film which we can see as a, um, a common work of you and of uh, Ronit Alcabetz. Um, First of all, when did you start to film Ronit and uh, why? And uh, when did you get the decision to transform all this material into a film? Uh, well, for the, sh for the shooting, uh, I've been shooting for the last um, almost three decades. I started to shoot uh, around the end of the 80s uh, when I could get a camera. When I started to shoot, I didn't really have any, you know, I didn't, I didn't mean to make a film. Of course, you know, I was shooting because I was infatuated with the idea of uh, the ability uh, to capture time in, a, in, in different ways and uh, to decide what I see, what I do not see. I never used my camera to connect with people because I, I, I I didn't need it to create a conversation or I never felt uh, I'm using the camera to protect myself or to create a barrier between me and the, and the people I'm shooting or, or the things I'm shooting. Actually, it, it's, uh, it, it, was, uh, it, it was the opposite. Whenever I used to um, operate my camera, uh, I think I felt that people are uh, seeing me. And not, not the other way around. I felt that whenever I'm shooting uh, my subjects, uh, I felt that people are seeing me. This is where I'm being, this is the time where I'm being looked at. Hmm. Uh, which was very interesting because uh, it gave me the ability to create uh, a metaphys dialogue with, with the people I'm shooting. That was one thing. And the other thing that, uh, that, uh, happened to me with uh, with shooting footage was uh, was the sensation of uh, creating uh, layers of time you know in the 80s it was very difficult to, to get a camera uh, but i did get uh, this elmo eight millimeter and and uh, i went to this city in israel to to get it and the guy that sold it to me also sold me um, uh, one cassette of uh, 100 feet which is like around two and a half minutes and uh, I had this cassette it was like black and white and I had the camera and I at the time I was shooting stills and I said okay that's my time to shoot like motion and, uh, and I knew that I have two and a half minutes and that's it and I was going with this camera everywhere I was uh, maybe 19 or 18 I, I don't remember but around that time and I was going I was going with this camera everywhere and I wanted to shoot everything I wanted to shoot my grandmother I wanted to shoot my parents I wanted to shoot school. I wanted to shoot the road. To I, I remember I had this day, and I really wanted to shoot the me walking uh, to, to school, just the just just the way. But I was very cheap because and stingy because I knew I have two and a half minutes, and and so I was just like you know I was as if shooting all the time. I was as if shooting. I was wandering for one year, shooting uh, but not really shooting. And then uh, the, the time came and there was this day and I shot uh, and, and I was actually in Ronit's room and looking from the window to, uh, to the buildings in front and it was a gray, a gray day in February uh, the clouds were very low, it was very monochromatic and I said okay that's going to be the shot that I'm shooting because it's, it's amazing and, uh, and everything is there in place and everything looks low and uh, I started to shoot and uh, I said, I'm going to take 10 seconds or 20 seconds, and that's it. And that's going to be my first, uh, my first shot. And I started to shoot, and then this woman comes in, uh, maybe like a Caucasian woman, Georgian woman, came into the shot. Uh, at the time, she looked old to me. I don't know the, the age exactly, but she was wearing like black veil and everything, you know, like a very traditional. Um, and she started to cross the passage 
and she was walking very, very slowly. And it was amazing because the wind uh, you know, blew the veil and it was black and it was incredible. And, and, I, and I was captured, you know, and then when she finished the, the passage, the two and a half minutes were finished, of course. At the time you heard, you heard it. In different ways, as an artist, it was a, an artistic trauma. And I thought, that's it, you know, this is my two and a half minutes. Mm-hmm. I finished it, it's done, and probably I will never see it because you have to send it somewhere. But since then I was looking to create more of this time. And slowly, slowly, of course, I got a camera years later and like another camera and another camera. And, and I shot and I shot and I created these layers of time and I, and I archived. What I did like every six months, I would go to my cassettes write what's in it, put it, see if it's working, see if I have to duplicate maybe, maybe it's not. And I did it for like 25 years. Um, and Ronit was there because um, Ronit was the perfect, uh, the perfect image. Ronit had this thing with the camera that there was always an intention, whether you shot at her in, for documentary or just like a still shot or or of course in the films, there was there was always an intention and the minute she she was in my frame, uh, I felt like I'm making cinema. And of course I loved on it uh, and I still do. And you know, when, when she was with us, it was uh, amazing to create this, like, you know, the camera was there. So, and slowly, slowly people expected me to shoot them as well. Like my parents, if I would come for a couple of days and I would not take my camera out, they would be um, not angry, but uh, disappointed, you know. So everyone wanted me to take the camera and shoot. And then mm-hmm. I enjoyed it. And I just collected. I considered myself as a collector of time, collector, a, an archivist. Um, and I, I love to play with the light and I love to play with the texture. And I just enjoyed it. And, and I was lucky to, to make films. Not long after, like a few years later, I, we made our first feature film. So, in yeah. fact, this basic material, this what we can define as home movies of your, of Ronit, of your relationship with Ronit, with your family, um, are conf- uh, confronted in the film to um, the fictional images of your trilogy. Right. Uh, to take a wife from 2004, uh, the seven days from 2008, and the trail of Viviana Amsalem of uh, 2014. And there is a very interesting circulation in the film between reality, with, uh, between these home movies and the fictional image. Right. I want to ask you, how did you build this kind of circulation of meaning of feelings, of senses, uh, yeah. between the documentary and the fiction to the process of montage. Right. Yeah. Um, well, you know, I started to shoot my images as personal images or home movies. But what happened in 2003, which is like 10 years into the shoot of my documentary materials, is that we started to do the fiction films. And when I came back home, to shoot my parents or when I started to shoot on it, things started to mix because, you know, I came home and I'm shooting my parents in the kitchen and all of a sudden I feel like I'm shooting Pondre Femme again. Part of the game was to find Pondre Femme in reality. So it, it stopped being my home movies. I did not just want to shoot my parents. I wanted to track where does my parents act like Vivian and Eliao in the film. And, and I started to aim to something. And Ronit as well, you know, she was Vivian for me. And at that point, when I was looking at her, after editing her, you know, I started to see Vivian in her in a, in a very specific way. I just did it, but what really happened uh, in 2016, after the death of Ronit, uh, a few things happened. One was the image of Ronit became the image of absence. The image of Ronit in my, in my materials became the image of absence. She became an image by herself as opposed to a, a, a living person. So that was one thing that was very, very powerful for me. And, uh, and, and I started to explore that. And, um, and, and I wanted to make a film 
I knew that I had great materials and I said, maybe I'll do a documentary film. I will see, I'll go back home. I'll see, I'll see what happened. And I did that film. I did it. And I had like this um, 40 or 60 or 70 minutes of a film, like a regular documentary film. Uh, very interesting. Everybody, uh, everyone who saw it really liked it. Uh, it was uh, moving. It was uh, nicely edited. Uh, but I was really bored with the film. And I, and I said, why do I do it? Why do I do it to own it? Why do I do it to my parents? Why, why do they need that? You know, they're already in the, in the fiction films. Like, uh, and, and maybe someone else will make a film about Ronit. I, I don't need to make that film, you know, someone else should do it, not me. Um, of course, I was attracted to, to the materials, but yet, but, but my, but I'm a director, a film director. And I, and first I look about on the film and I say, it's not good enough. I should not make it, you know, it's good. It's cute, whatever it is. And then haunted by the materials, I, I, I had an idea one day, which I brought to Joel, uh, Alexis, the editor, and I and uh, we came to the editing room and I told her, you know, it's very strange. We always treat these materials like uh, the past. Why should we treat the materials like the past? Let's 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 do something else. Let's treat them like the present. Let's say that every time that we meet in the editing room, watching the rushes, we are in the present of our characters, and not. In the past, it's not the past of Shlomi, of Ronit, of whoever. This is the present, and if this is the present, it means that you and I, Joel and Shlomi, Shlomi and Joel, we're coming from the future. <laughs> and, and if we're coming from the future, maybe, maybe we have an ability to to change destiny uh, in cinema. And this is how the film really started to happen, as uh, as what we see in Kayanwar. You know, you know, we do a lot of things in life. We're not necessarily aware uh, of what we're doing at every second of the making. We have an idea and we should have an idea. Of course, we should have an idea and we should have a, a strong intention and a profound, uh, a profound modesty when, when we're doing something to let it happen. But it's, but sometimes we discover things after we make them. And apparently, the material that was there uh, could serve the idea that we had in the editing in the editing room, mm -hmm. and it was it was of course it was it was not like this. We had like three hundred shifts in in this editing room. We, we edited for like three and a half years, uh, but everything was there. Eventually, we found every shot we needed, but every shot we needed, and even better than what we could have imagined and why you took this decision to divide the theme in two parts first part for needs second part vivian and to make the this uh, the theme structure as a diptych um, and for me vivian was always the construction always vivian is the construction vivian is the predict vivian is the box and vivian is the place is like a place it's a person it's um it's um way of living, it's tradition, it's religion, it's geography, it's Israel, it's Morocco, it's France, it's all of this. And Vivian is this place where you run away from and you come back to. Vivian is the place that devours you, but at the same time gives you birth and puts you out. So Vivian is like the the base of everything. Vivian is a philosophical idea, but if you want to, if you want to put Vivian um, just like, you know, in life, yes, Vivian is on it, and Vivian is my mother, and Vivian is Vivian Amsalem from the trilogy, and Vivian is many different women that we know and women that we don't, do not know. But this is like, if you, wanna, if you wanna treat it as like a drama, but if you wanna treat Vivian in a, in a, in a, in a higher a spectrum, it's an idea. Vivian is only an idea of something, you know? Um, and, and, and Vivian is the beginning Vivian is the beginning of, of, of everything for us as filmmakers. And I wanted to start with Vivian. At the same time, uh, me, when I direct fiction films, I never make a separation between the actor who's, 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 who's portraying a character and, and the character. I don't have this. I, I, so if I want to make a way, if I want to make a trail, I will try to make a trail between 
vision, the idea, to the person which is on it and try to go through this way. And I need two structures to, to, to two structures that will have a dialect between them to create this like one big sentence that I, that I want to say. And also I, I, I really wanted, uh, and this is vanity, I really wanted to write one more role to on it. Another role, written role. Mm. Not just like a documentary film that describes uh, her last years or like a real role, a role of a woman against time, nature, death. And this is why we can see also this trilogy, uh, this film, uh, Cayenne Noir, as fourth part of the trilogy. Yes, of course. Well, of course, yes. Because it's uh, it's the presence of uh, Ronit, and uh, it seems really like a common work, and it's also prolonged the theme that 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 are uh, treated uh, in the in the trilogy. So yes. we can see also this documentary, the Cayenne Noir, as a fourth part of the fictional trilogy. And this is, and also the circulation of of the of the of, of images between documentary and fiction in the film. It's it's um, it's uh, enforce this uh, this feeling. So the, the the material of the film are very heter 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 heterogenic. There are documentary, there are fiction images, there are home movies, there are images from your travels throughout the world. Uh, but uh, something which unifies everything is it is the voiceover, this beautiful voiceover uh, that you uh, that you said that you have written, and which is um, very poetical, very lyrical. I call it as um, uh, the, the voiceover is like a, 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 a elegia, like a prayer. Uh, I wanted to ask you about this voiceover, uh, how was the process of writing it? When did you decide to integrate it in this way, the voiceover in the film? So I did not really think I will, I will voice over the film and I will cover it with explanations because uh, well, I didn't need. So there was one thing, I found myself in the editing room talking to on it mm -hmm. in my head, like, uh, and every time I was talking to her, it was, it started with Zoheret. Do you remember? Do you remember? Um, do I remember? Is it reality? Is it fiction? Is it like, do you remember that? Basically what I'm doing, my first action was verifying is everything that is happening is happening to us? Like, can you confirm? I'm asking her, knowing that I will not get an answer giving myself the liberty to believe that everything is happening. This is one, one thing. And then I, needed to, uh, then I needed to draw a line between, between the past and, and, and the future and the present, a line which I wanted to destroy later on, but I needed to draw it before I take it out. And, um, and, and the story of the Berber was giving me the ability to like, uh, to draw this line when I asked Ronnie, do you remember that I went to the Berber and I asked him, can we stay in Paris? And he told me, don't worry about Paris. Look, your sister, take care of your mom. Your mom, it's going to be hard for her. It helped me build the construction of the fictional side of this, of this film. But I drew the line and every time I felt I want to deconstruct it, I needed to add something small on it something small on it you know everything that will help me like uh, i don't know the word yet and then slowly slowly i i i i wrote the i i wrote the the, the voiceover uh which is like the voice of the berber the voice of the voyeur the voice of the person who knows who knows the future who knows what what will happen so with the voiceover i actually give the future the voiceover is the oracle of the of the film. Mm -hmm. um, a part of, of, of this voiceover is also uh, extra from uh, 
from uh, Ronit's uh, notebook. Uh, right. and, you, and you told me, because the first time I, we, we talk about it, you told me, I told you it's a diary. I th you told me, no, it's not a diary, it's a notebook. And it right. was very important for you that uh, it will be a notebook. And this is the reason why you call the film also Le Cahier Noir. And yes. the term journal, it doesn't appear. So what is the difference between this notebook and, 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 the, and the diary? Uh, and, and journal and because the, the, the in the journal you write uh, the things that happen maybe or, or you document from your own point of view things that happened uh, and, uh, and and you know this is the purpose of writing it is like documenting and I did not document you know I did not document when I first started to make the film I was using it as a sketchbook as a notebook and in a notebook you can write you can mix the quotidian and the sublime you can you can put in a notebook you can write uh, i have an idea for a film uh, a woman wants to get a divorce um, but she cannot unless the husband says yes a liberté uh, point okay and under i write uh, pay electricity buy diapers to her name <laughs> ta, 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 ta. <laughs> so in one page you have the the sublime you have art you have the the highest form of thinking, and you have the life, every everyday life. And for me, Cahier Noir is this, is like the, 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 the sublime and the quotidien hmm. it every time they meet. So that's why I wanted to call it just a notebook. It's just like a, a, a bunch of paper or, or, or film or a tape, the things are written on it, because uh, it's different than when we shoot a film we say quiet, everyone is quiet, everything is like, you know, uh, everybody is prepared and we're shooting the shot. And when I shoot, I say noise. You know, when I shoot my, my camera, okay, act, you know, noise. I need, no, I, I want things to, to distract me. I want the daily life to, to pull me out of the seriousness of, um, mm -hmm. of making. Last question, Shlomi. Yes. Uh, it's about the music, the use of music. There's a lot of uh, music in the film and uh, Maria Callas, Mahler. Uh, but I wanted to ask you about uh, the use of uh, Ber Bernard Herrmann music, uh, the music he wrote for Vertigo by Alfred Hitchcock. For right. me, it's very significant, significant uh, music uh mythical music uh but also a music which is uh associated with a woman which is a a woman which is in the in the border between life and death between reality and imaginary uh so i wanted in what we call in fra in, in french in femme fam in femme fantôme Okay. I wanted to ask you about this choice, about Bernard Herrmann music in the film. Well, if we go to, you know, if we go to Vertigo, it's a, you can describe this film in so many ways, but you can also say it's a film about obsession, you know, yeah. it's a film about a man yeah. with obsessed with, uh, with uh, this woman and he's, he's keeping her alive in different ways as we know the film. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, not only but, but what's interesting in the film, though, it's not only the, the obsession, it's, he's also recreating death every time. He's recreating death and he's alive again. She's alive again. In the cinema, we are phantoms. Whether we're alive or dead, it doesn't matter. When I enter Cayenne Noir as a character, the phantom of Chloe. Because I'm a phantom in the film, I can talk to the other phantom, the dead or the alive. And, um, and, and it was, uh, you know, it was, it started as a, it started as something uh, very, uh, we played with it. It was my dream to use it because, you know, especially with Herman, every, every passage you write, say, love scene, obsession scene, this scene, chase, everything is like, you know, very, very clear. You get, you have everything ready. And, and I said, we will never be able to, or we we'll never be able to get it also. If, even if they want to give it to us, we, we cannot pay it. So, uh, but let's play with it. Let's uh, let's enjoy it. Um, 
let's enjoy it because it's perfect. Yeah. And and whenever whenever we put the Herman music, what happened is like is like uh, every little uh, every simple gesture became a film, and it was like a contract between me and the viewer, the listener. It's like you see, I'm putting this music here. It's a classic music film from one of the most classic films existing, and 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 you have to believe that it's a film. It's not just a documentary in that sense, not just, but it's not that, it's like a film. And I have to tell you that there is no documentary and there is no fiction. Whenever you see a frame, it's a film, whether I put this music or not, but I know you need that and I need it too. And <laughs> let's put it, let's put it there. And like, um, eventually, you know, I will not go into the whole story, but eventually we did get uh, the rights to use the music. Uh, some of the original one and the rest we had to record ourselves um, and it was just like um, it was just like uh, the perfect voiceover for this film and it's amazing when I saw Vertigo last year and because uh, I'm used for the last five years I'm used to hear the music on my film I actually saw two films I saw Vertigo and I see Cayenne Wow always, always together, you know. Uh, and, and when I started to see, when I started to use the music of Vertigo, which I've seen a few times, and I remember the music very well, I saw Vertigo when I was editing. I was so, and then it vice versa, it, 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 it went the other way around, and it, it's a play, and it's an honor. Yeah, I would say that uh, both Vertigo and Calle Noir, our film about women, becomes eternal to the to the meat. To the meat. Um, thank you very much, Lomi. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you very much. Thank it was great.